Um, so I thought what we would do first is just do uh, 10 second introductions from each of us just so you know who you're hearing from. And then we will um, talk about the structure of the panel, what we hope to cover, um, and, and sort of move down the row. So I'm Jessica Waters. I'm Associate Dean for Undergraduate Education and SPA, and also a faculty member in Justice Law and Criminology. Uh, I'm Brianna Weedock. I'm the Senior Academic Counselor in the Department of Government for Undergraduate Students. I'm Paul Wells. I'm a junior and a political science major in the School of Public Affairs. I'm Becca Lamb. I am a sophomore in the School of International Service. I'm Nicholas Hunt. I'm a sophomore in the School of Public Affairs. I'm Tatiana Lang. Um, I'm a junior, a CLEG major in SPA. And I'm Fanta with the Office of Campus Life, and I'm also a faculty member in the School of International Service. All right, so welcome everyone. Um, so the title of the panel, Respecting and Cultivating Intellectual Diversity in the Classroom, I have to tell you, we, we rewrote that about 17 times because um, we were trying to figure out how to capture what we were getting at. And I think that the, the best way to um, let you know sort of what we were thinking is to tell you how the panel evolved. Um, so this started with, as I think all good things do, with a, a series of, of conversations. And as we heard at a panel this morning, dialogue, right? Dialogue matters. Um, and it was, you know, folks like, like myself and Fanta and Margaret Marr and Brianna talking about what are our students experiencing? What are we hearing from students? And then it was um, right in the beginning of the summer, I guess, Towards the end of the summer, there was a kickoff breakfast or a kickoff um, picnic with the leadership program, and I was talking to Nick Hunt, one of the students here, and he started talking about some of his, his experiences in the classroom. And when you hear a message from one student, you think that's interesting, and when you hear it from two students, you think, huh. And then when you hear it from three or four, you think maybe something's going on here. And what we were hearing was this: we were hearing that. Some of our more conservative students, our veterans, our students of faith were feeling marginalized in the classroom. They were feeling like their voices weren't being heard and they weren't able to engage in um, you know, a really robust debate in class or on campus with their professors and with their peers and able to voice their opinions and be respected at the same time. And started hearing this, you know, quite a bit. So um, Fanta and I convened uh, a panel of students to start to hear about their experiences and said, we want to hear from you. Tell us what's going on. And the things we were hearing were startling. Right? We were hearing that they felt like they couldn't actually express their views without fears of things like retribution and grading. We were hearing that they were being um, marginalized by their peers. And in the dorms, they were having, you know, not sort of the heated, robust debate we want folks to be having, but really hard conversations that weren't productive. Um, so Fanta and I and these students started talking about, you know, what, what can we do? Um, and what can faculty do? Because faculty have a responsibility to be able to facilitate these conversations in the classroom. So that was the starting point. But then it kept evolving, right? Because as everyone knows, the fall semester, there was a lot going on in the world. Um, and Ferguson and other issues were bubbling to the surface. And we were watching um, our students and our faculty and our staff struggle with how to address these really tough issues in the classroom. Um, and you know, some folks have heard me say again and again, um, I think we have a lot, and I, I would venture to say the vast, vast majority of our faculty and staff are incredibly well-meaning and everyone wants to engage in constructive conversation, but so many of us aren't trained to do so, right? Mm -hmm. um, I might want to have the most you know, wide-ranging, open conversation about Ferguson I could possibly have, but I'm not a trained facilitator, right? I'm, a, I'm an academic, right? I'm a lawyer, right? Lawyers don't necessarily foster the best conversations, right? <laughs> um, so you know, we, we started talking about you know, what, what can we do here and, and what's missing. Um, and so then at the end of the fall semester, um, Professor Marr and I had met with um, students of color in SPA, and I started hearing about their experiences. And I was hearing that, you know, from, I had met with this group earlier on about intellectual diversity, and then I was meeting with students of color about um, some of the issues they were experiencing in the classroom, and there were common themes, right? We were hearing this sort of, you know, I'm not being heard, I'm feeling marginalized, there's an atmosphere of mistrust, I can't talk about the things I really want to talk about. And we said, we need to do something here, right? We need to expand this panel. When we talk about intellectual diversity, we're not just talking about, are you conservative or are you liberal, or is there something else going on, right? So how do we, in an age when we have um, 
so many really complex and sensitive and tough issues that we have a responsibility to address in the classroom. How do we do it well and how do we do it in a way that is most effectively reaching our students? And that's why it was really important for us to hear from the students today about their experiences. So um, Brianna's going to give us lay some groundwork for us and then we'll hear from our students who will tell us what, what they've experienced and, and what they've gone through and, and some of the challenges and, and triumphs that are happening in the classroom. And then um, Fanta, she is so good at doing, will um, help us pull it all together and get some lessons learned out of this at the end. So, Brianna. So I'm going to give you the theory part. Um, so stick with me. Um, there are, when students come to college out of, out of high school, they're going through a series of developmental phases, identity development, but also intellectual development, as we all know. Um, and there are several kinds of intellectual development theories out there in, in um, education, but what they all kind of share is the fact that the students are starting from this um, intellectual starting point of very dualistic thinking. They're thinking in terms of good and bad, right and wrong. Um, there's one authority, that authority is in the front of the classroom, um, so what you say matters, right? Um, and moving forward through their intellectual development, <clears throat> excuse me, until they get to be able to recognize multiple and conflicting truths and knowledges and be able to manipulate, manipulate those and talk about them without necessarily buying into any of them. Um, and so that's what we want to get our students to be able to do. Um, so it is a little troubling that we're hearing that maybe they're not able to experience and, and explore all of those points of view. Um, one of the um, models for fostering intellectual development that is um, primary in the field is this, no, is this model of challenge and support. So you want to challenge your students, but also support them at the same time, right? Um, Environments weighted too heavily towards either of those um, of those ends promote defensiveness, anxiety, learning breaks down, disengagement happens. Um, so you know if you have a, a, an atmosphere that's that's too challenging without that supportive aspect, um, the students just get frustrated, they shut down, um, and go home. And if you have the opposite, where they're not being challenged to hear the multiple viewpoints. They're just being supported in whatever viewpoints they're coming to the table with. Learning doesn't happen either, right? Um, they're, they get bored. They're hearing the same things over and over again, um, taking the same classes from the same professors. Um, they're not really learning. So the importance of the classroom environment in the whole intellectual development cannot be overstated. Um, it's not only what the students are assigned to read and um, the conversations that they're having outside the classroom, but also the, the classroom atmosphere that's being fostered. And those of us who teach are completely responsible for that, right? Um, so the, the students are coming to the classroom and they're relying on the faculty to be the ones who model critical thinking skills because they don't have them yet. And so they're really relying on what they're seeing um, coming out of the classroom um, in order to be able to learn those multiple viewpoints without having to hang their hat on any one of them. And they're also relying on the faculty to really moderate that classroom. You know, protect them from attacks from their peers, which we're hearing um, students are, are experiencing. Um, but also to make sure that um, whatever we're giving out to the students as well is, is challenging, but perhaps not um, absolutist in, in, a point, in the point of view. Um, <clears throat> this challenge and support model and, and the classroom environment is, is important in, in all of the stages, but perhaps it's most important in that first stage to get the students from the dualistic thinking into um, being open to hearing more points of view. Um, and, and 
the the other the other stage where it's going to be fairly important is is in the later stages too where students are looking to be able to manipulate various points of view um, you know if we're only giving our students one side of the of the argument um, they're not learning how to logically build their argument um, counter to that right um, I think that's really the the intellectual development theory part of it that I want you to kind of be thinking to hang your hat on um, when you're hearing from the students and and what their experience in classes and on campus has been so uh, we're going to turn it over for the, the student voice now. Um, I do want to say that we did um, strongly encourage them to all be as frank as possible and told them this was a safe space to be frank. So um, you know, please, please do it. Right? We, you know, we want to we want to hear um, we want to hear what you're really experiencing. Right. Well, you know, um, you know, this is a learning conference, right? And we can't learn if we're not being honest. Um, so we, we want that honesty so that we can engage with what you're telling us. So mm -hmm. dive in. Okay. Um, so. Uh, I guess I'll start with, with speaking to uh, the issues that Dean Waters mentioned, uh, specifically concerning topics such as Ferguson and other racial issue conversations that definitely came to the forefront uh, during the past semester. Uh, for me personally, uh, in the classroom, I really only experienced those conversations uh, in one particular course that I was taking last semester, uh, Social Forces That Shaped America. Um, and obviously it was not part of our syllabus, uh, but it was definitely something that, that kept coming up in conversation. And for me, where that sort of discomfort came from was many of my classmates making assumptions about my opinions of uh, the Darren Wilson trial of, of other racial issues that came to the forefront uh, in new stories and, and incidents that, that, that occurred during the past semester uh, based on my racial identity, the fact that I'm an African American, and uh, I, I one one classmate in particular, I remember us talking after class one day, and he said, "Well, obviously, you're gonna think that you know every cop who shoots a black kid is racist and terrible and deserves to die because that could be you." And I said, okay, well, I think you're really simplifying this too. I said, I think, think we've missed a couple of steps here. I said, because first of all, I am not going to take this one incident and apply it to all of law enforcement, apply it to every white cop in America, apply it to every male black teen in America. I said, and also, uh, we're, we're not discussing here what were the specific characteristics of the encounter concerning this situation. Um, what are the racial biases, the political biases, the political implications, the racial implications that are present here? Uh, how have things been spun by political pundits, by voices in the media? Um, and how are we bringing that spin and those biases into the classroom and allowing it to manipulate what we're adding to the conversation? Um, and, you know, uh, I, I, I will be honest in admitting I think my personal background, my experiences are different from, I think, the stereotypical, if you will, stereotype that exists in many, or I will say many of the people that I have encountered con concerning this issue about black male teens. Um, you know, growing up, I was raised by both parents. I come from a, a, a household that I guess most people would consider upper middle class. And I live in a community that is predominantly African American. Um, so 
uh, you know, I, I come from a family of law enforcement. I have many family members who are attorneys, work in the district attorney's office in New York City, uh, many family members who are sergeants, lieutenants in the police force. Uh, the police director in my town, I kid you not, lives two doors down away from me um, and used to be a camp leader when I was younger. So I, uh, while my parents definitely made it very clear you are a black man in America and, and there are certain stigmas, certain implications that come along with that, I didn't grow up in an environment that, you know, speaking specifically to law enforcement, that it was something that I needed to fear or it was something that I needed to have an abrasive attitude towards. And then looking at it from the viewpoint of other students of color that I have encountered in the classroom, I, I think in my experiences, I've also faced a lot of backlash because of that because I don't approach the conversation from this place of aggression and from this place of we're being persecuted, we have to fight back. Um, over the break, I was having a conversation with one of my friends from high school, and I'm sure you all are aware of the incident that happened in New York City with the two police officers who were gunned down by the gentleman from Baltimore. And, uh, you know, I said, I... I, I said to him, uh, honestly, that I was afraid, you know, I said, this, this is what I was afraid of, that something like this would happen because, uh, you know, with, with all of these incidents, Eric Garner, Mike Brown, just, you know, Trayvon Martin before that, the, 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 these, this is how people are going to retaliate because instead of sitting down and engaging in meaningful conversation and coming to the table and saying, how can we bridge the divide? We're just trying to deepen that divide. You know, there that that that's that that that's what people are running to, and, and that's not gonna solve the long-term issue. And he said, Well, how how can you say that? Don't you realize you're black? Like, do you think the white people you encounter don't fear you, don't think you're ignorant, they don't make these implications about you? And I said, okay, well, you know, honestly, maybe some of them do make those assumptions about me when they meet me. I said, but should I take it upon myself to engage in intellectual conversation with them and perhaps break down some of those barriers, break down some of those biases, or do I become this aggressor and just, you know, uh, essentially develop this attitude of I hate white America, which to me is 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 not productive and is not really uh, approaching a place of unity. Um, and so uh, something that that I look forward to in the future, something that that I hope happens in the classroom is that people will lean into the discomfort try as best we can to turn off our biases, turn off our assumptions about the implications that are present, uh, specifically concerning racial issues, as well as other issues that are going to, you know, concerning various aspects of identity that are going to come up in the classroom. Um, because I believe that's how true learning is fostered and, and that's how we're able to not only enhance our ideologies, enhance our level of intellect concerning a lot of these issues, but also gain a deeper understanding and respect and value for someone else's opinion, regardless of whether or not we agree with it. Thank you. All right, back in. All right, so a little bit more about me. I am from California. I am a Republican. I am a Christian. I am pro-life. I am a feminist. Um, and I'm very proud of all of those things. And um, I've been taking classes in a uh, major in the SIS and um, towards a minor in women's gender and sexuality studies. And I was so excited to come to AU and find a place where I, you know, I've been a minority in California in terms of my political views, but a place where similarly I could discuss issues that matter, learn about issues that matter, 
kind of like Brianna said, have those things challenged, but also supported by my peers and my, um, my professors, and learn the complexities of gender and sexuality, human rights and development, these things that I care a lot about. Um, and I've been taking gender classes, and um, my experiences are mostly, that I'm going to talk about are mostly from those. Um, when I had last semester, um, my professor, we were talking about kind of where sexism comes from. Um, and <laughs> my professor just straight off of the bat um, said it, the Bible was, you know, the reason sexism exists in the world. Um, and immediately another student and I, who was Catholic, we both kind of had a reaction to that and, and things got pretty heated after that because several of the other students in the classroom were like right away, oh yeah, absolutely, they agreed. And so this other girl and I had no idea how we were supposed to respond to that. Um, and there were several other things with just those kind of clash of perspectives that I had to go in and, and talk to this professor in office hours and make sure she knew that, you know, who she was talking to and, and why it mattered. Um, this past semester, I took a gender class um, and uh, very early on, my professor pulled up on the big screen in a class of 40 people, a map of America with um, uh, abortion clinics on it all over um, and kind of talking about the injustice of the fact that there's so few and that they've been closed down and that um, it's hard for people to get transportation to them and this huge you know, right that, that um, she was upset that people didn't have. Um, and that was just very startling to me to be taught. Uh, it was just part of her kind of curriculum. She was teaching this. And um, later on, one of my classmates made a comment. We were discussing you know, these issues and one of my classmates was making some smear on the so-called pro-life movement and, and all of the ways that the pro-life movement was talked about. Um, there were never any positive things. There were never any serious things even. It was all actually laughable. Um, you know, the only things that were talked about were bombings of abortion clinics or kind of these really awful things, but there was never any other side um, to the conversation that it was all, okay, if you're pro-choice, you're good, and if you're pro-life, you're bad. And I think that's been a lot of my education when it comes to that issue. Um, and so, you know, me being a conservative, I'm a minority, but me being pro-life, people, like, their jaw drops, they, they don't understand how I can call myself a, a woman and a human and, and stand up for those things. And I think I understand that to a certain extent, but I also feel like it, it is that way because of the way it's talked about by professors and by students. Um, and then another uh, documentary that we watched in class was a kind of history of the feminist movement. And um, it was just, you know, Democrat after Democrat, all the, all the women that they talked about in politics. Um, and the only Republican women were Phyllis Schlafly were very demonized, very kind of um, actually, you know, like I said, laughable. My classmates were laughing behind me, and and um, I started, you know, I, I was watching this documentary, and I was like, okay, this is kind of kind of one-sided. And so I pulled out a pen and paper and started writing down, and I had a whole list, full sheet of paper by the end of the things that were kind of really, <laughs> um, really portrayed um, one, in a very one-sided way in the class in that um, movie. Um, and in an environment like this, there is no way for me to raise my voice and be respected by my peers um, without ridicule. And I've talked to my professors. I've, you know, made sure that they know um, why it matters to me. But it also makes me want to not take those classes anymore. Um, and so I did decide not to continue on with that um, minor. But I feel like that's very, you know, people have said, Nick was just telling me, you know, wow, you're so brave. People have told me you're so brave for being a conservative in gender studies. And I never thought that going into college that I had to have this bravery to, you know, take classes in a subject I was interested in. Um, and I think there is a, a real important part that the faculty can play in the climate of the classroom and what my classmates are gonna say about my views. Um, and I think it's all about the, the shared value that we all have of students thriving. Um, I think no matter what you believe, whether it's a transgender student, a Muslim, a racial minority, or someone like me, we all want to have a culture at American University in our nation's capital where we can discuss issues that matter and where everyone can say, okay, I can share my beliefs in the classroom, in the dorm room, um, outside, because I do want to talk about these things, but I don't want to feel like I have to hide those parts of my identity. Um, 
friends have asked me, close friends have asked me, no offense, but why did you come to AU? Like, why are you here if, if you felt this oppressed, if you're kind of this minority? And I understand those questions, but it makes me really sad because um, I love it here. And there's so many things I love about the kind of people that are here. I think I've become a much more tolerant human being and, and learn how to respect other views because of this school. Um, but I feel like if you're not in the minority, are you learning that? Um, and I think that's a really great value that we all should have. Um, and that's part of an educational um, environment, an academic environment where everyone has their views challenged, everyone has their views supported, um, but you don't feel like you're an evil person or you know that you're just this, this single minority because of it. Um, and so I think some things that I've just thought about that uh, faculty can do is um, when it comes to the readings that are assigned for class, I think multiple perspectives is really important. I found myself yelling at and, and underlining, audibly yelling at with my roommate around my, my textbooks um, in these classes because just statements that were made were just really absurd. And um, I think there's definitely things out there that are <laughs> two-sided. It's not like you know, professors can't find them. Um, but I think they need to be deliberate about it. Um, and I think making everyone defend their beliefs, no matter what they are, um, is really important. I've talked to friends who've said, yeah, I've had some professors who weren't so great at that, but I have had professors who, you know, regardless of what the professor believed, they made everyone defend their own perspectives and made everyone think about, you know, what was the, op you know, the opposite perspectives. And, and I think that's good for all of us. And so um, I think it's really crucial to a well-rounded education. And, um, really crucial to fostering a true atmosphere of tolerance, um, especially here, especially now. Um, and so I think that's a really important thing to me. Just a quick note, I think it's worth noting that Becca did go to her <laughs> professors. I've talked to many students who feel like they can't even have that conversation. So, um, you know, kudos to you for, for attempting it. Um, but we, we have a lot who, who feel like they can't. So, Nick? Thank you. Um, so my name is Nicholas Hunt. I'm a sophomore class of 2017. I'm a member of the SPA leadership program and I also am privileged to serve as president of College Republicans this year. Uh, this issue has been predominantly, the marginalization of conservatives has been in my, it's been my number one issue since coming here because I was an early decision student. I was very excited about coming to AU, seeing that it was the most politically active campus and to have that opportunity to study in the nation's capital I was beyond excited. But to be in my first class of my freshman year, and the professor was going around the room talking about uh, the latest election, what it's going to mean for America, certain economic policies, and he was going around the room asking who people had voted for. And when I said I voted for Governor Romney, he called me a moron. So for executing my civic duty, it set such an unfortunate tone for me, but it has led to such a promising, promising view for me. Um, as a member of the leadership program, sophomores are challenged to look into social issues that they uh, feel very passionate about. And this is one of them, uh, the issue for me that uh, really I'm very passionate about. And in 2013, one of my peers conducted a survey on the political demographics of American University. And she found that 98.4% of AU students can report that they have heard other students making disparaging or hurtful comments towards another student's political minority, uh, political, uh, yes. Um, and then when you uh, expand that to include professors, the number is 79.1%. And for me, it's one thing if a professor is expressing their political views, but to, to be able to cultivate a bipartisan discussion is uh, key for me. Um, you know, you can sit through classes where clearly one side is being shown, but the, a professor has to be able to admit that one side doesn't have all the answers, and neither does the other side. You have to be able to respect both discussions. And so going off on that, it's just the tolerance in the classroom is so low, and it sets a deadly precedent for people when they go back to the dorms. One of my members on my executive board actually had to file a report against another student because he kept harassing her about being conservative. And for me, we are a university that prides ourselves on diversity and prides ourselves on inclusion. And to be able to ignore this issue for so long, it really set, uh, 
it sets this hurtful tone for any conservative student. And as president of College Republicans, I hear day to day from my 200 members, you know, this is finally my safe space where I can be who I really am. I don't have to hide who I am in the classroom. I don't have to hide who I am to my friends. I can finally be open about my identity. And th it, that uh, notion is reinforced nationally from a 2004 survey that found 31% of students at the top 50 colleges reported by US News and World Report uh, said that 31% of students felt that they needed to hide their political or social views in order to get a good grade in the class. And so with that, I conclude my remarks by saying we have to listen to both sides. Neither side has the answer. And what you say, your word choice on certain issues, it can really leave a hurting impression on a student. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm a junior, as I said before, and I also was an early decision student to American University. So um, I was very excited also to come to this school. Um, I come from central New Jersey, and my town is one of the more diverse towns in New Jersey. So, I mean, I decided to choose a school that was diverse as well. Um, so when I got to American University, I wasn't necessarily surprised because I knew it was a predominantly like white university. But I think something that surprised me was how conversations about race happened like in the classroom. Not that they happened, or like, you know, that, you know, I was most of the time, I'm an, also an honors student, sorry. So in my honors classes, I'm usually the only African American student. Um, in my non-honors classes, I'm probably one of two or three. So very, very much a minority in the classroom. So I think the difference, I was listening a lot to what um, the students have been saying. And uh, peop, um, your name is Nick, sorry. Mm -hmm. Nick was just talking about how people have to hide like their identity in the classroom. And I think what's hard is uh, we really can't hide the fact that we're African American at a predominantly white school. So the conversations happen. I'm an SPA, so there's a lot of racial conversations to be had, whether it's criminal justice or affirmative action, um, affirmative action especially. Um, and when those topics come up, I think something that happens a lot is everyone looks towards the one or two African Americans in the classroom to answer for the entire race. So um, I've had that experience probably in just about every class. Um, some classes it happens like, you know, a lot su more subtle than others. Um, but I've actually had an experience last semester in a constitutional law class. And we were talking about affirmative action from a constitutional perspective. And we were reading like the arguments and one of the arguments that one of the Supreme Court justices gave was for affirmative action is that, you know, it adds to the diversity of conversations and classes. And then the professor, I was, there was three African Americans in the class. And then he said, well, he looked at the three of us who we were sitting next to each other. And he said, well, what would you guys like to add to this conversation? Um, and I remember looking at the other two students. And the two other two students in the class, they kind of just looked at each other. We looked at each other. And they didn't really say anything. And I just, I said out loud, um, I didn't think it was meant to be taken that literally. <laughs> um, so, the, the, class, the classroom laughs at the statement. I don't know. I feel like the professor felt a little embarrassed because I don't think he meant to, like, you know, he didn't mean to, like, you guys are black, so, like, what do black people think? But that happens a lot less literally in the class anyways. Um, that was one very specific, very obvious example of that. I can't say it's the only time it's happened that literally, unfortunately. But I mean, there's, it's kind of to be expected if you come to a predominantly white um, university. But I think faculty could avoid things like that, especially that specifically, <laughs> that very specifically. Um, but also just <sighs> conversations about affirmative action are hard. But I think it's, that conversation shouldn't not happen. Like, you know, just ask a question and wait for people to answer rather than what do you three students think? Um, and I'd also like to point out that these conversations were hard, like before and after Ferguson. So um, before Ferguson, before the entire nation was interested in talking about race, like being an SPA 
we talked about race anyways. I take a lot of criminal justice classes, so it's kind of hard not to. Um, but since Ferguson, at least people are more interested and outright about talking about race, I'd say. In the classroom, I think, in my experience last semester, a lot of professors actually didn't speak much about it, kind of just let the students say whatever they were feeling and let the conversation go wherever it went, which was good in some classes, and it was very bad in other classes. Um, one experience I had was the, well, I'm also one of the students who organized the, the darkening, a big demonstration that happened at AU. So a few days before that, um, there was a smaller protest um, in front of MGC as well. And I had to leave that protest to go to class early. So I went to class and my classmates and my professor could all hear the protest happening outside. Everyone was walking around, they were pretty loud which was good, that was a point. But, so my professor, which I was happy that he did, he just like stopped um, lecturing for a few seconds to let everyone hear what the uh, protesters were saying. But then, like some pe most people stayed quiet, but a lot of students then started saying very, pretty negative things about the protesters. The protesters specifically, um, black people in general, I was the only black person in that class as well, uh, black people in general, um, the protests in general, things that were, most of the things were negative, but like, okay. But then there was comments directly about the protesters and black people in general, which are pretty uncomfortable for me to hear. And I kind of felt like some of my classmates didn't remember that I was in the classroom <laughs> because it's a predominantly white school. So it happens that there will be no like African Americans in your class. So I guess my main question after that was like, what happens when there are no black people in the class? Like, who, what do people say then? Because I was in the classroom and people were saying some pretty horrible things. And I was the only African American, so I had a hard time deciding whether I should say something or whether I shouldn't say anything. And I didn't want to say anything that seemed combative towards those students because I didn't have anything against them. But I was feeling pretty attacked being in that classroom. I did end up saying something after a while, after I could collect myself. But it was a pretty uncomfortable situation, I would say. Um, did not the, did just the professor because, say anything? Um, my professor, my professor did like say. He said like, um, you know, we sh probably shouldn't be like. One of the, after one of the really bad comments, he said he probably shouldn't be saying these kinds of things, like whether we're here in the classroom or not. Well, he said like the right thing, but he just waited a little too long, in my opinion. <laughs> but I mean, I don't think my professor said anything wrong during that classroom or necessarily did anything wrong. It was more the students, but it was a very uncomfortable situation. Um, and I think what Ferguson has done is had brought a lot more of these experiences to black students on campus because more people are talking about race, whether your class is about race or, or not about race, but people just are talking about it. And like whether you have positive or, or, positive or negative opinions about it, you are, are able to share your opinions. And it could just be pretty uncomfortable for students. It doesn't matter what your opinion is about it, but when the comments are more about like people and uh, a race rather than the situation that's actually happening, that's when it becomes like hurtful and, and unnecessary in my opinion. So I think you know, condemning those statements wouldn't be wrong because if we're having conversations about Ferguson, there's no reason anyone should direct their statements at any AU student because no AU students are, had anything to do with that. So any of those statements could definitely be condemned by a professor, by students, because wrong is still wrong, even if we're having a conversation. So, and that's, I think, what's been the most interesting to hear, because a lot of students have things to say about, things that have nothing to do with Ferguson, in Ferguson conversations, um, things that have to do with AU, AU students, black people, black men, and I think we, sh I mean, not that people shouldn't have those conversations, but there are some things that I think are clearly wrong, and it, they should be like, you know, told that they're wrong and I can say it but like you know I'm usually the only African American in the class and pretty much the only person saying something other than that which is another problem because 
there are other students in the class who I'm sure know that students are saying pretty horrible things, but are either too afraid or just don't have enough, you know, I don't know, they weren't affected directly, so they also don't say anything. But when you only hear negative opinions and negative comments, that's what's pretty disparaging as a student. And a lot of African American students have shared those same feelings with me. Like, you know, most of us don't feel that everyone at AU is racist and that we made a bad decision by coming to AU. But, you know, our allies are just pretty quiet when all this stuff is happening. So that would be helpful for us if our allies would also speak because we're the only voice so many times that it's hard to be the only voice when there's like a when there's like a combative like thing going on as well and that's all i have to say for now okay um so a lot of food for thought obviously um we um in the spirit of this discussion we do want this to be a conversation and we'd like to hear from you now um about your comments or reactions or questions for um, the students or, or any of us. Um, I don't think any of us on the panel pretend to have all of the answers. Um, so we're hoping we can, we can come to, to some of them together. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think the takeaway from this conversation was very important and that is all viewpoints should be respected and everybody, regardless of your viewpoint, should be encouraged to share. And that's very important. I wanted to like add to that that um, like another category of viewpoints. So like here, which I guess at the university it would make sense that you have in this type of discussion to be conservative views represented mm -hmm. and, and, and kind of um, identity issues, which again, uh, all viewpoints are important. But I do think there's also um, in, like liberal, um, liberal economic issues, <coughs> I think is also kind of another domain where people might be afraid to share. Like I think liberalism can be associated very strongly, especially at universities, with social liberalism. Mm -hmm. But there are also, you know, people who believe just as strongly in economic liberalism. And I think mm -hmm. sometimes uh, those viewpoints also um, people might be hesitant to share those mm -hmm. because you don't hear as much about that. Interesting. You know, so like you have record income inequality and all these things, mm -hmm. and so. You know, th I think there's also, on the other side, the um, economic liberals who might, in certain instances, feel that their viewpoint is a little bit more drawn. Interesting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, first of all, I enjoyed hearing all of your experiences. Can you please speak up? Oh, sorry. I enjoyed hearing all of your experiences. Thank you so much for sharing them. Um, I wanted to ask about, uh, do you feel, or have you seen indicators in the classroom that have been successful for you um, when talking about controversial social topics that may be unique to higher education that you didn't experience in high school or elementary school? Um, so an example that's really, really broad um, that we did in third grade was everybody sitting in a circle, you know, so that you could see everyone's face while they're talking, you couldn't turn your back. So mm -hmm. it, it can be as broad as that, but something specific that you felt was very encouraging for you to express your viewpoint or if you didn't have the experience at all. Um, well, I, I guess for me personally, um, in one of my classes we did an activity um, I don't know exactly the name of the system or interface, but basically it's a technological program where uh, the professor can set it up where you would like text a message to a number and it'll pop up on the screen. Um, and we were having a conversation uh, related to politics and and one of the issues that we had in that class as Becca and Nick spoke to was the fact that a lot of students who held more conservative uh, views particularly related to social issues uh, did feel a lot of uncomfortability uh, but I think doing that exercise people were allowed to be as, as frank as they chose to with their opinions, with it remaining anonymous. So if a message popped up on the screen about someone's opinion concerning the conversation, you didn't know that that came from Paul or Tom or Liz or whoever. Um, and afterwards we discussed you know, with the professor, is this something you all wanna do more often? And a lot of people did remark that it made them feel a bit more comfortable about being honest in their opinions concerning the topic. So perhaps different initiatives like that could be very helpful. Mm -hmm. One, one, one um, 
everywhere. Pull everywhere. Pull, yes. Thank you. Yep. So one, one, um, just a practice pointer. So I, t I teach um, reproduction and the law, which you can imagine there are a lot of, um, a lot of viewpoints on that. Um, and it, you know, and it, I'm a litigator by training. So if you Google me for 30 seconds, you find out which side I litigated on. Right? So it'd be really easy to figure out, you know, what my views were. So one of the things I, tr I try to do two things in that class. Um, one, I acknowledge up front. I say, if you Google me for 30 seconds, here's what you'll find. But here's what I want you to know, that I could care less whether you agree with me or not. And like, you know, I will challenge you no matter what. Um, and the other thing I do is a couple weeks into the semester, I do anonymous feedback. Mm -hmm. And I ask, I send around an anonymous survey, paper in the class, and you know, leave the room and say, do you feel like your, your viewpoints are respected? Do you feel like you can express them? If not, why not? Right? Tell me what's going on. And you get some really good feedback. Um, and I've had students say to me, you know, you use this term. You know, you, you, know, you, you said fetus instead of baby, or you said this. And they call me on it, right? They really call me on my language use. And so you pick up on that when you get that feedback from students. So mm -hmm. I, I find that helpful. Yeah. I just wanted to ask that down. What would you prefer that the professors do? Because mm -hmm. professors are aware that they shouldn't turn to you. They're outside. You were part of it. I don't know if your class had to, but how might that have played out? Would you have preferred there was no conversation? Or would you have preferred that the professor directed? And if so, how? Um, the conversation or the comments that were being made about the protest or after the protest, is that what you're asking? The situation, yeah. what mm -hmm. did the professor have done? What would you like to have I think done? in that situation, allowing people to talk isn't the what's wrong, because definitely people should be able to express themselves in the classroom. Um, but definitely um, talk, um, stepping in a bit earlier, because the negative the negative comments were pretty much the only comments, and they were going on for a few minutes. So I feel like after maybe three or four comments, it was pretty obvious where this conversation or lack of conversation was going. So I wouldn't say it's something that would apply to every conversation, because I would hope that not all conversations that happen at AU are that um, negative and one-sided. But the professor did step in, just in my opinion, like way too late. Um, after a few minutes, and have, if the professor had said exactly what he said earlier, um, it would have allowed for more comments on, uh, more positive comments, or not even positive, but you know, just not offensive comments, so and I would have... So they don't want to turn to you, they don't right. be part of it. So should they say, does anybody else have a different opinion? No, just when a wrong, a negative comment is made, saying that it's wrong and negative. Um, and for example, myself, I was trying to figure out how to respond myself. But if a professor would have uh, stepped in earlier, just to say, to not to me, not to anyone who wasn't saying anything, but just you know that comment that you just made towards AU students was offensive then that would have opened a door for me to then say something rather than just waiting till I felt comfortable enough because all I heard was like plenty of negative comments. So it wasn't that I wanted the professor to turn to me or students not saying anything and say, can you guys say something now? But you know, there are statements and that I think are just wrong. Like it's not an opinion statement. If you just say like these students at AU are and then insert negative thing, like that's pretty obviously wrong. And that's what was happening in that um, instance. So I wouldn't say it would apply to just every conversation, but that in that particular case where those reactions to something that was happening were wrong and offensive, that's what I would say. Not point to everyone else and say, well, can somebody else please say something? But you people who are talking. to say what he or she thought. One of the other things that I have found has been helpful, I've, I've taught gender classes as well, and you know, a lot of um, charged conversations happen in those classrooms. Um, and one of the things that I have employed is when we're talking about something that I know is going to have a lot of emotional reaction to it, um, I, I set the ground rules that we're, we're going to have this conversation um, and 
while we're talking, we're going to take breaks and you're going to write down your thoughts and you're going to take a second, collect your thoughts, think through what has been talked about and where you want this conversation to go next. What that does is it, it helps diffuse the situation in a little bit. Um, it takes the pressure off of any one person for having to step in because you know that that's going to be kind of part of the conversation. And it also allows people who really need to step back for a second and process before they step in to do that. Lots of hands. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah so um, having sat on both sides of the desk here at uh, AU, um, I'm really perplexed by the issue of race here on the mm -hmm. campus. Um, it, and so from the teaching perspective here at AU, uh, it seems that um, whenever there is a discussion about race and identity or power, et cetera, there's always an expectation to talk about people of color or more specifically African Americans mm -hmm. as the problem. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I frankly think that part of addressing inequality is to really deconstruct whiteness. But in my classes that also are I have been predominantly numbered by um, majority students. Um, there's always these expressions about racial fatigue, and mm -hmm. oh, why do we always have to talk about race? Mm -hmm. And so I guess to the four students on the panel, what I'm particularly interested in, because I'm literally stumped by this question, mm -hmm. and, I, and it, actually I find that I become more of a, my activism uh, sort of bleeds more into the classroom where I then begin to promote my particular personal politics as opposed to giving that sort of more robust um, sort of framework. But from four students here, how can we approach the issue of, of deconstructing whiteness uh, as a counter discourse to all this sort of stuff mm -hmm. that you guys have mm -hmm. talked about? I talked about this a lot in one of my classes this semester on identity, race, gender, and culture and had some really good conversations with um, friends of mine over the break who don't go to AU and who are asking me, okay, I'm white, I know I have privilege, I don't know why it matters so much, and tell me more about it, I wanna know how, you know, you talk a lot about this, people talk a lot about this, why does this matter, you know, kind of maybe feeling that racial fatigue or whatever. Um, and I think something that I've learned by the conversations that I've had here is um, the importance of what Tatiana was talking about as being an ally, and how to be an ally. Um, because people don't just, know that um, mm -hmm. unless they're taught it. And so I think I've learned a lot of really good things and I've sought out knowledge <laughs> because I know it matters um, of how can I as a white person help and how can I you know, not be silent but not say the wrong thing and, and it's hard and you do really have to want to know it. Um, but you can definitely teach that in the classroom. How, how can we, what is this concept of being an ally and mm -hmm. you know, whether it's you know, a, you know, any kind of minority uh, situation you have, there can be a, a place for the majority to speak. Um, so I think that's a really important thing to teach. Also, I'd like to add that one thing that's worked for me since I've been having these conversations for a while now is to make sure that whoever I'm talking to knows that it's not a personal or individual issue. Mm -hmm. Because when I'm talking to my like white friends and allies, some people are really defensive um, automatically once you start talking about race. Mm -hmm. Um, whether they are agree with you or disagree with you, it's just uh, before we started talking, like, I'm not racist, uh, all these things, and I'm like, I never thought you were <laughs> racist, like, we're about to sit down and have a conversation. But, like, you know, if we're going to talk about racism, we're talking about, like, you know, institutions and things that are way bigger than you as an individual, um, and just trying to get uh, people to understand that nothing is their fault as an individual like even though you know racism is you know people only certain people can benefit technically from racism but you know you're not the person who created these institutions and you're not the person who made it that we're living through this society right now so the fact that you want to have this conversation is all that I'm like focusing on <laughs> so don't be so personally offended by talking about racism like some things might you know, startle you because we're talking about institutions that were created by white people, but 
you know, take a deep breath and it's not, a, it's, so people, I always think it's funny when people say like talking about race is exhausting, um, when white people say that because um, being a, a minority is pretty exhausting too. Um, so, I mean, I don't know, I kind of find that as an, an uh, entertaining statement, but when people say that to me, I kind of just explain the other side of it. Um, it might be pretty like tough to talk about these things, but I mean, if we're not talking about it, then I'm going to continue having all these negative experiences. I'm, you don't talk about it, you just don't talk about it, but some people actually have to deal with these issues, so I think we should talk about it, regardless of whether people are uncomfortable or tired. So, I mean, usually that works, so. Can, can we take many, we'll take several questions, I think. Go ahead. Um, there are a couple of hands in the back there. Yep. Yep. So we'll take three questions at a time. I'm Fran Noir, I teach in SSC, and I teach public relations classes, so I don't usually talk about politics, but inevitably I work for Bush White House, so inevitably when I talk about my work, people know what side of the aisle I land on. <laughs> and what I've been finding is very interesting is that not even the students that are in my classes, but their friends who are Republican come to my office or they find me, and they feel like it's a safe place that they can talk about, and they end up telling me some things that just make me really sad, that similar to what Tatiana was saying about, well, you know, tell us how the African American voice about this, that, that professors will say to those students, well, you're a conservative, yeah. so tell us yeah, that did. you. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. not, you know, it just makes me sad. And I've also um, sat on search committees, hiring folks, I've listened to my um, fellow faculty members lecture, and it's, it's embedded in the lecture, it's mm -hmm. embedded in the curriculum. Yep. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think that faculty even really know sometimes mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. that it is. Mm -hmm. And so it's just troubling. And I, I also try to implement you know, objective readings that maybe offer a, a critical view of maybe the way the White House communicated something and from a public relations perspective. Mm -hmm. And what I find is that my students um, don't believe it. They, mm -hmm. they push it away. Mm -hmm. And they say, well, I don't believe, I don't agree with that. That can that can really happen like that. And, and then they'll quote John Stewart, they'll quote John Oliver, and it's because this is what they are mm -hmm. Uh, we in the back there, Kelly. Um, uh, if, if it's not too uncomfortable for you, to talk about, I think one of the things that Nicholas and Becky did was give specific quotations, mm -hmm. and, and I, I, I think I'm understanding what you when you say negative things. It's not that they that people were speaking about the fact that they didn't like the march. Right. It sounds like they were saying personal things that you found personally offensive. Could you give an example? Sure. So the protest was loud, as protests are. So some students felt it necessarily to, necessary to, you know, associate that loudness and obnoxiousness with because the protesters were black. Um, that's one example. Um, somebody made a pretty horrible comment about um, what that they felt that they should call the police, which is pretty ironic, but they felt they should call the police um, on those students um, and that they should be arrested and thrown in jail, um, which was, I don't even know what words to use given what the protesters were protesting. Those are two examples. But basically, comments that had nothing to do about Ferguson or about necessarily what people were protesting, but you're black, so you're loud and you're obnoxious and you should be in jail, which is pretty much what all the comments were saying. Well, the ones that I was reacting negatively to, that's what they were saying. I mean, not that they were disagreeing with the protest or they were on Darren Wilson's side, like that wasn't a problem, but you know, these pro these black protesters are really obnoxious because they're black and mm -hmm. you know, we don't want to hear them and things like that. Yeah, and just, so go ahead. Oh, okay, no, just, just to add to that very quickly before we move on. Um, uh, it's referring to the same protests. One of the things that I saw on social media is a student, um, there was a die-in that occurred as part of the protest and a student took a photo and posted it on Facebook and his comp, this is, this is not a direct quote, but paraphrasing it, he, he used the word monkeys and basically said something to the effect of, oh, I guess the monkeys forgot to sleep last night. And, um, 
the reason why it how it came to my attention is I'm a resident assistant in Anderson Hall and several of my residents saw this on Facebook liked the comment and some of them were in the lounge on our floor laughing about it and I just I, I, I really couldn't understand and then they were reading other comments off of Facebook and Twitter along those same lines that students here were, were posting on social media right what <laughs> Well, it's not so much a question. First of all, I, I really enjoy hearing the students. It's mm -hmm. great to hear all this. Um, in my classes here, um, I, I don't. I don't know if this is good or bad, but I try to avoid politics. I have. I mean, this is a principal's course in economics. I teach. There is so much theory, information. I mean, I don't have time to get into a lot of politics. And often, um, students ask me what my politics are about a particular issue, and I never answer them, because I don't think I'm there to, I know I can because I'm in that position of authority, but I'm not there to take advantage, to, to proselytize my views. I, I don't like doing that. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think any of my students would know where I am on the spectrum. And um, so I never got involved with any of this stuff, Racial issues only come up in the sense of income distribution in a very general sense, but not about race specifically. And um, so I don't know if this is good or bad, because I'm at AU, it's a very political environment, but we hardly ever talk about politics in my class. So, so, so I think that's actually a good segue, um, because <laughs> part of my response to that, and this happens all the time, um, in my role in campus life, <laughs> I often say I have the pleasure and the displeasure um, of spending a lot of time with students that are sitting here. A lot of time. Um, I can't count the number of times when I get that call or someone is knocking on my door after a course or several courses and wanting to just sit down for an hour, sometimes more, to literally just let it all out. Um, and I hear these all the time. And there are a couple of things that I want to kind of react to. One is, you know, I think um, there's, there's this notion that there are classes that lend themselves well to these topics and there are others that don't, and I'd like to debunk that myth as soon as possible. Because I think even the courses that we think in many ways are value neutral, they are not. They really are not value neutral for our students. So an economics course, whatever that course is, from that student perspective sitting in the classroom, I think, they will bring to it a lot of different lenses. And if we're talking about issues of economic distributions, it has racial, it has gender, it has so many other layers that are attached to it. And faculty, I think in many ways, rightfully so I understand, wish to figure out how do we stay focused on the subject matter, but the subject matter cannot be, I think, devoid from the folks who are sitting there and what they bring to the subject matter. So that's one of the things that I think I want to bring out to this group, because I hear from students all the time about how when we try to not address them, students will find other ways to address it. And silence is a way to not address it, and they immediately pick up on that, and I hear that a lot. So that's one thing I really do want to emphasize in this room to this group, because this is something that I see coming up again and again. With that said, I think there are a couple of things that I also want to bring up, and that is this notion of the fact that, you know, for our students, it's really this issue again that I bring up, and it's the sociologist in me, and I can't help it, but it's really this issue for our students, and you heard it from our panel, about what does it mean to be at AU, and what does it mean to belong, and what does it mean to be. Mm -hmm. You kept hearing from our students the fact that when subject matters come up, and they're not being addressed in the way they need to be addressed, it's not about what is your political position on it. It's the fact that we're helping our students think through those issues. Mm -hmm. And that also, we in many ways are vulnerable to our students in saying, I don't necessarily have all the answers. But together, we're gonna to try to figure it out. And I think that is a fundamental part of what education has got to be about, particularly for our students. The other component that I hear from our students is the fact that when that doesn't happen, then what we force them to do is if they can, because they, they may not always be able to do it, they will hide. Mm -hmm. And once they've hidden, I think then again we have denied them a fundamental education. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the reason why I wanted this panel to absolutely happen is really to get back to the fundamentals about the fact that 
for an institution that really values intellectual discourse at its fundamental level, the more we can all come to grapple with the fact that our students are telling us a lot. Whether we want to listen or not, they're telling us a lot of things about what is the value of their education. And part of that really means how do we help them to be, but also to belong. And that, I think, is a very difficult task for all of us to do. But I do think there are tools that are very much available in order for us to do that. And we could, if we had another hour, I think we could come up with 20 ways in which that happens productively every single day in our classrooms. And those are things that I think we can really all benefit from. If I were to pull in this room, what are some of the strategies based on what you've heard from our students? What are strategies that you've used that have been effective? I think each one in this room would name what some of those strategies are. But one of the things that I think came out of this conversation is language. I cannot emphasize enough how critical language is um, and how many times we don't give it enough credence. But once our students pick up on that, then that becomes the door that opens or the door that closes. Mm -hmm. And so that has come up a lot of times when our students have said, you know, this is sort of some of my, some of my you know, sort of my thinking. We didn't bring onto this panel other viewpoints because I've been doing a lot of focus groups on this. I mean, I could have brought 20 other students today to this meeting. Um, but another viewpoint that we didn't raise today that I think also I have heard a lot from are our veterans. Yes. Mm -hmm. We are getting more and more veterans who are coming to our campus, and I'm hearing from them as well that when they walk into that classroom and when people know about their affiliation to the military, there's so many assumptions that we make about their political orientation, about every aspect of their lives. Mm -hmm. And one student, I think, said it beautifully when we did the focus group, Jess, and the student said, I learned how to play the game. Mm -hmm. And I learned to play the game by basically testing out the system. Mm -hmm. When I gave the professor what I thought the professor wanted to hear, I got an A. Mm -hmm. But I learned that the hard way because the first time I really wanted to provide to the professor my viewpoint, and I saw what my grade was. Mm -hmm. Now, we could sit here and argue for an hour was really the grade related to their political orientation or not and so forth. But what I do want to leave you with is that whatever, whether that is the case or not, the lesson that that student learned from it was, it is not OK for me to express my real viewpoints in this class because there's a consequence to that. Yeah. And so I really do hope that as a community, we not only open the door for more of these conversations, but that when we hear them, that we not necessarily dismiss it, dismiss it and said, oh, Becca, you're calling yourself a minority. You have no right to call yourself a minority. I've heard that before. Mm -hmm. Or when you know, a veteran says, you know, I really feel that I'm marginalized at AU, that again, the response is, you can't be marginalized because fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is something that I have taken away from my conversation with students about these issues. Thank you all. Thank you.